All right. Um, I happen to co-direct a uh, laboratory with Matt Robinson, so I get the opportunity to introduce him. Um, and I figure everyone here has access to his CV, so I'm not going to belabor too much of that. I'll just tell you a little something about Matt that you might not know. Um, so Matt and I met at Colorado State University 10, 12 years ago now at this point, uh, when we were both master's students uh, way back when. And Matt and I found common ground out on the mountain biking trails, where <laughs> Matt, you may or may not know it, can make a mountain bike, quite frankly, look like a pogo stick. <laughs> I'm really not joking. He was an international class rider. Um, so you can sometimes find him in the early morning in the trails surrounding Corvallis. And if you think something went by you pretty fast, it was probably Matt. Um, so he's been dragging me around for about 10 to 12 years on the mountain bike, and I was fortunate to help recruit him here to Oregon State University. And now he's lifting me up in the laboratory as well. Um, so his background in brief is in amino acid metabolism, largely as it relates to the regulation of blood sugar, uh, skeletal muscle, and how the skeletal muscle responds to insulin. Uh, we're so busy these days that I could not tell you what the heck he's going to talk about. So with that, uh, I'll hand the floor over to Matt. That's, that's a great segue. I um, get a little nervous being introduced by a friend because there's so much that he could dig up and, and share. So thank you for those kind words, which is good. Um, and uh, hopefully the next little bit should um, be a bit entertaining. I know we've got a wide audience here. Uh, everyone's coming from a lot of different aspects. Um, so I hope to bring some kind of new things that we are introducing to the lab, um, bring out some ideas that may be uh, new to the field as well. We're hoping to push forward some different thoughts. And um, if, if neither of those resonate with you, hopefully it's just an entertaining time um, just to see some new things that were going on in the lab, some new research capabilities here at OSU. So we're going to start off this afternoon talking um, a little bit about metabolism, but we'll talk first about traffic jams and rusty cars, which is exactly what we want to talk about on a Friday afternoon, right? And what we're going to start off with is looking at a traffic jam and identifying what's the problem here. Is the problem the bus? Is the problem all the cars? Is the problem the road itself? What's the issue here? And understanding that just a quick snapshot of this picture doesn't tell us everything that's going on underneath. The same thing happens in metabolism. When we take quick snapshots of disease states or even different things within the muscle, we don't know everything that's going on under, underneath. And I'll be introducing some concepts related to the kinetics, the underlying processes, to help answer some of these. The next thing we'll go is the rusty car. What's the problem with this car? Is it a problem with the car itself? Is it a problem with the manufacturer? Maybe they should have made it better in the first place to have it last. Is it a problem that it's sitting in this yard for so long? Is that the problem with this car? Or maybe we'll blame the mechanic. It's not keeping the car up, and that's the issue. So both of these concepts, the traffic jam and the rusty car, are going to be playing in to, as we talk through diabetes and particularly skeletal muscle. So what's the problem? The problem that we're trying to address here is diabetes, in that there's about 1 in 11 people who have diabetes currently. That's projected to be 1 in 3 by 2015 as a major public health problem. And if I take the entire time, there'll be 190 new cases by the end of this hour of type 2 diabetes. So this is a major public health problem, particularly given that this is costing people tens of thousands of dollars personally out of here. So that's our problem that we're working on. Overall, we see a pretty high prevalence rate of diabetes across the, across the United States, and really it's, it's an international problem now. The, the dark here is just representing high rates of, of prevalency. When we take these maps and overlap them with obesity rates, they're almost superimposable. Areas of high rates of obesity have high rates of type 2 diabetes. That's just bringing in this concept that they might likely be related. And so our lab is focusing on this and trying to understand what is it about or obesity that's leading to diabetes. So what is causing diabetes? This is a billion dollar question right now that we're trying to push that envelope just a little bit forward. 
At some level, we recognize that there's a variety of factors playing into it. It's low exercise capacity, low exercise tolerance. People may just not be moving as much. There's an overnutrition issue, such that we're eating a bit too much, not burning off as much, an accumulation of fat mass. And then all along that is this concept is that we have this increasing concentration of the hormone insulin, which is having an, a number of uh, potential downstream consequences. All these factors are feeding in at some level of an impact on fuel metabolism. Now, where are fuels burned off? In primarily the skeletal muscle and the mitochondria. That's our major site of fuel metabolism. One, by mass, we just have so much muscle within the body that any alterations in those metabolic pathways could have some pretty profound effects. And two, because the mitochondria are the main site for um, a number of oxidation states, particularly of lipids. And lipids, these fats, are going to come up a number of times throughout this talk here. So one, perhaps this is just a traffic jam issue. We've got too much nutrients around, and it's flooding into the system, and the mitochondria can't handle it. That's a possibility. <coughs> Another possibility here is more related to the renewal of, the, of these proteins. Okay, So this is the rusty car, the concept that perhaps we have enough mitochondria around, but they're just not being renewed properly, and that they're developing some damage, and that they're not functioning properly, such that they're not able to oxidize off and burn off all these excess nutrients. So we've got the traffic jam and the rusty car concept here. This is the underlying kinetic processes, the synthesis and the degradation of proteins, the renewal aspects of mitochondria that we're going to walk through in a number of different conditions. So that's the underlying principles here. The last concept I'll introduce is, is insulin resistance. Okay? Insulin is a potent hormone that's released within the body, and it has a number of different uh, resulting activations depending on the tissue of interest that we're looking for. The one we're interested in are, is skeletal muscle. So skeletal muscle, its main response to insulin is glucose uptake. So insulin goes up, and that leads to an increase in the glucose uptake within the muscles. Insulin resistance is then characterized by a defect in this pathway. So more insulin around, for some reason, is not having the same effect on glucose uptake. Okay, so this is a resistance to insulin. It's this resistance that we're trying to understand a bit more. What is causing this lack of responsiveness to insulin here? And with skeletal muscle being the largest tissue in the body, if it's not responding to insulin very well, there's quite a large buildup of this glucose around. Okay. Leading theories right now are that the buildup of uh, lipid intermediates, so these are unoxidized fats, there's just too much, too many cars on the road, they're not able to be burned off as much, those accumulate and lead to a defect in the insulin signal. Okay. This is a, a prevailing um, theory that's been around for quite some time. Um, it's got a lot of traction to it and is pretty well accepted. The idea here is that if we have this buildup of fats, there's a blockade in the insulin signal. There's a few caveats to that, though. Some recent data has been coming out that says that with obesity, there's actually an increase in the capacity to burn off fats. And I'll present some of those data here today. Okay. So overall, if we have this accumulation, there's possibly this, this negative effect on insulin signaling. Our working hypothesis right now is that at some level, there's an accumulation of damage or a dysfunction within the mitochondria that is leading to changes in the mitochondrial function and that underlying all of this is protein turnover, the renewal processes. Okay? So coming back to that rusty car again, the idea is that insulin resistance is slowing this process down, leading to negative consequences versus, on the other side, exercise is a potent way to stimulate the synthesis of new proteins and the degradation of old proteins, so we renew it. So we activate the repair systems, we renew the mitochondria, and that allows for greater capacity to burn off some of these fuels. So that's our, our ongoing approach um, and underlying hypothesis here. We're going to address each of these with um, a couple different models that I'm going to walk through here. 
but this will be the background. So it's Friday afternoon. We're going to start with the punchline here. Okay, this is what I hope to drive home by the end of the, the presentation. One, mitochondrial metabolism can be very dynamically regulated during skeletal muscle insulin resistance. The second take home is that alterations to the turnover, the renewal of these proteins, seems to be driving the changes within mitochondria, focusing on the proteins, overall we call that the proteome, and also their function. The third take home is that we have a building body of evidence, not just us, but a number of others um, around in a variety of institutions, are finding that it seems to be overnutrition and not necessarily intrinsic pathology within the mitochondria that's contributing to this disease progression. Okay? So those are the three take-homes. Sound good? Go for it? All right. Fantastic. So our lab, how are we actually approaching this? This is our homepage on our, um, our website. Our basic goal out of the Translational Metabolism Lab is we're trying to improve health, and we do that through a process we, that's called translational research. Okay? And I'll walk through how we do this. Our goal is to understand human disease pathology here. We do that with exercise models. We do that with obesity models. We try to understand as much as we can in the human doing a variety of different clinical trials as, as far as we can go. Once we've reached the end of what a, a human project can tell us, we then jump into a, uh, usually a mouse model where we can alter genetics or do some other tight controls that can't be done in a human. Once we've taken the mouse model as far as, as we can go, we'll jump back over into an even more basic model, which would be cell cultures. We'll grow muscle cells, treat them with a specific whatever it happens to be, hormone, nutrient, something like that, and measure its response. We'll take this as far as it can go, knocking out genes or overexpressing things or controlling whatever we need to, and then bring that back to the human to say, are we able to recapitulate some aspects of human disease in the mouse? Can we recapitulate some of that in the cell culture and actually provide a little bit more insight into what's going on on the human side? So I'm going to pull out each of these aspects, the human, the mouse, and the cell culture arm, and explain how we're trying to address this diabetes approach with current projects that are going on. So first off, let's start in the humans, our favorite model system. So it's us. The first question we're asking is, what are the effects of acute exercise on skeletal muscle? We'll focus a, a bit on the mitochondria for the purpose of this talk, but we have a number of other questions we're also asking with this. Harrison Steerwalt is a PhD student who's really spearheading all of this. Our basic concept here is we're walking through and asking, is there a difference between lean and obese adults and under resting conditions or compared to an acute bout of exercise? They get put on a bike, ride a bike for an hour, and then see uh, what's different between the resting condition. A couple of our main measures are we're determining insulin sensitivity and the mitochondrial activity. I'll walk through how we do each of those. Our main way is by taking muscle samples before exercise and after exercise, and then during a procedure that I'll describe with an insulin infusion to look at the insulin response. We collect our, our muscle samples, and then we can do a number of analyses there. All these are happening here at OSU down at the new Samaritan Athletic Medical Center. So this is a, a, a new facility, just opened doors, I think two years ago, I think is basically when it came out, two and a half years ago. Uh, it's right next to the stadium. We're able to operate out of there with some excellent support staff from clinical staff who um, are here in the audience as well, who, um, and uh, nursing staff, physicians. It's an outstanding outpatient facility that we can now come in and start doing these are our, our invasive human techniques. I'll walk through our human protocol and then pull out the one piece of data that we're going to be really focusing in on. This is our overall protocol that we are, are working through. And I'm just using this as an example of, of the capabilities. Okay? Participants come in after an overnight fast, and we place two IVs into them. 
These two IVs allow us to do controlled infusions and then also repeated blood samplings. And these little asterisks on the bottom are the blood samples that we take. So all told, at the end of the day, a person donates about um, half a blood donation through this entire project. The days are, are separated um, by a couple of weeks. And their only difference is one day is a rest day and one day is an exercise day. And that's designated here. The rest day, they're literally lying in bed just watching TV. Or the other one, they are uh, riding a bike for about an hour. Before they ride a bike, um, we'll uh, um, start in with the uh, uh, blood sampling, the IV placement. Immediately after they come off the bike or their resting condition, we'll take a muscle biopsy sample from them. About an hour and a half later, we repeat the biopsy sample. All during that time, we have this tracer infusion going. And this tracer infusion is a, a glucose metabolism um, analysis. This allows us to tell how their body is using glucose to measure out their insulin sensitivity. After that second my muscle biopsy, we start an insulin infusion. And this is a, a very important part that I'll, I'll going to highlight here. It's a controlled IV infusion of insulin. This is to raise insulin to a predetermined level. And then we maintain their blood glucose for the entire time using another infusion of glucose as well. So during this entire period, this is about a three hour period, their blood glucose levels are clamped, they're steady. And so we call this procedure an insulin clamp. At the end of that, we feed them a meal because they're pretty hungry, they haven't eaten all day. It's about two o'clock in the afternoon. And then once they're feeling fine, we remove the IVs and send them out. So it's a pretty involved project. Um, our, our students are there and we're there um, quite early in the morning to pretty late in the afternoon. So let's pull out what this insulin clamp can tell us a little bit more. It's a controlled IV infusion of insulin. What insulin is going to try to do is lower blood sugars. And so on one side, I'm showing how much glucose we're infusing into the person. Okay? So this is actually a, a glucose infusion. <coughs> and right early on, we have the start of an insulin infusion, and so we need to raise the amount of glucose going in. If we didn't increase glucose going into the person, blood sugars would, would crash. Notice over here, this is blood sugars. This is making sure that we're keeping a person steady. Our people are right about 100, and that's where we want to keep them, right about that 90 to 100 range. Okay. So over time, we make subtle adjustments to the glucose infusion rate over time, watching their blood sugars over time to make sure that we keep them steady. So as the blood sugar starts to go down, we then raise the amount of glucose going into the person. It keeps them steady the whole time. I'm giving some example data. Um, we haven't run statistics because this is an ongoing project right now. But these top bar bars are from the exercise condition. These black circles are from the control resting condition. And just at a first glance, notice that it takes a little bit more glucose for the person to keep a steady blood sugars. That means that they're more responsive to insulin. They're more sensitive to insulin. That's not groundbreaking. It's been known for quite a while. But that's the model. Here. We're able to take a muscle biopsy during that time, and we have an insulin-stimulated condition here. But we'll have to be coming back later to show those data, because those are ongoing. The data that we do have right now are from the mitochondria. So we take our muscle sample, extract out the mitochondria, and then drop them onto a little machine that measures how much oxygen the mitochondria consume. That's the primary function of the mitochondria here. We can add in a few substrates, which stimulate the mitochondria, and we can t pick apart specific aspects of the respiration that we want to test. So the whole time we're measuring oxygen consumption. I'm going to focus in on just the maximal rates here of how fast these mitochondria can, can work. So between our resting and our exercise days, this is our measure of oxygen consumption. This is our maximal level that we can stimulate them. There's no major difference between <coughs> mitochondrial function from the rest of the exercise day, even though there's maybe a little bit of difference in insulin sensitivity here. Okay? So this is acute exercise. No major changes in mitochondria. We don't really necessarily expect it because not a whole lot has changed. We've just done a single bout of exercise. 
So what about exercise training? If we were to do this for several weeks over time, what happens? So um, Sean and I haven't had time to do a training study yet, so I'm going to pull some data that um, I was part of before I came here, um, back in my postdoc at, at Mayo Clinic. This is when we did um, a training study. This was three months in younger and older adults. Older adults are at risk for developing insulin resistance. And so one of the questions we had was, are there different types of exercise? What are their effects on insulin sensitivity and mitochondrial function? So we had three groups. Um, one did an aerobic style exercise. One did a resistance style exercise. And then the third group wasn't too excited, but they were the sedentary group. So they weren't exercising. We did um, a variety of metabolic studies ahead of time, and then after exercise, we did it. But the sedentary group then came back, and they were happy because they did a combined exercise training, which mixed aerobic and resistance all together. And then we studied them again afterwards. So this is a three-month training protocol for all these participants. I'm going to focus in right now on the aerobic exercise group because that's our predominant stimulus for mitochondria. At baseline, the older adults had lower mitochondrial function than the younger participants. This is a classic thing with aging, where we have lower mitochondria content and their activity is a little bit less. Okay? But what happened with exercise training? I'm going to focus in on this high-intensity interval group. This is the aerobic group. What we're looking at is the change in mitochondrial function over baseline. These bars here represent 95% confidence intervals, and this horizontal bar is zero. So anything that overlaps this horizontal bar at zero is no difference from baseline. And in both the younger and the older groups, we're able to increase their mitochondrial function. What's kind of amazing, when we look at the, the numbers here, their average increase here was a, a unit of about 200, compared to a baseline value of a about 400. So in the older adults, this is an increase of nearly 50 and even some people 60%. These are huge increases in mitochondrial respiration. Very large. Just over three months. To the tune of these younger or these older adults were actually normalized to the younger participants from baseline. One good yeah. question. Uh, yeah. What's older and younger? What's the, the, the so age? So younger was under 30. Older was 65 to 80. Our average age was 70. Yep. So mitochondrial respiration went up pretty robustly with, uh, with exercise training here. So we have a major gain of function. But there's a number of steps leading up to the gain of function. We could have changes in the genes and how the genes are activated. We could have changes in the actual proteins themselves. We could have changes in the, the function as well at the tissue level. So we asked the question, what are some of the major regulatory pathways? Where are the biggest bangs for the buck happening in the gains of function? And I'll spare you some of the um, intricacies of it. Our bottom line was that we saw many changes in mitochondrial proteins, and these proteins were not related to the mRNA. So genes got activated that weren't actually made into proteins. It was this disconnect between the the transcription, so the formation of new genes, and then the actual proteins that get made. The idea was then possibly the main site of regulating these proteins is not at the genetic level necessarily, it's more at the protein level, the making of new proteins. And that process, the making of new proteins, is called protein synthesis, and we measured that. And how do we do this? Okay? The way that we measure protein synthesis is using an amino acid tracer that's infused into a person. What the tracer does is it's um, the same, it's recognized the same as any other amino acid in the body. Amino acids are the building blocks for proteins. The tracer is just slightly different. It can be distinguished from other amino acids in the body. And so we can measure that. We can see that it's different than anything else. We take muscle biopsies over time and we can look at the accumulation of that tracer in a protein. So at the beginning, the tracer content is pretty low. Over a couple hours, it goes up a little higher. And then over time, even more, we have this pretty robust increase, the accumulation of this tracer. 
And all we do is pretty simply just measure the change over time. And that's the rate of making of new proteins. Okay? Where the mitochondria come in is we take the muscle samples, we separate them out into some of their major components. Our highlight here is the mitochondria. And it turns out at the end of this exercise training protocol, there's a major increase in the rates of mitochondrial protein synthesis. Okay? So here we have more mitochondria, they're functioning at a higher level, and we have higher synthesis rates of them. So it all starts to fit together a bit here. Now let's bring in that rusty car, okay? That rusty car again. So we're making more mitochondria. Our next step was then to look at the mitochondrial proteins and analyze them for damage. Are there actually damaged proteins? We compared those against the, the sedentary group who didn't do any activity for three months. What we see here is we're measuring damage. The sedentary group had this increase over three months, an accumulation of damage. But our aerobically training groups and our resistance training groups, both of them were protected against the accumulation of damage, just over three months here. So this renewal process seemed to be very protective here. Our, our final conclusion out of that was exercise was protective against the accumulation of protein damage there. So that's from the human side, building this case that there's no change in mitochondrial function with acute exercise, but over time, with exercise training, we can have these accumulations in both the synthesis and the capacity of mitochondria. All right. Yeah? Question about that study for the 12 weeks. Yeah. Did you take into account change in weight or initial body habitus or anything like that? Like, did weight loss have any effect on this? Yeah, so the, um, the people remained the same weight, but there was a loss of fat mass and a gain of muscle mass on them. So we purposely, we weighed them every week. We monitored their activity levels as well. Everyone had accelerometers. Um, so there was that, that remodeling for sure there. Their baseline activity levels um, is actually an interesting one. Um, we're analyzing those to see about their the responsiveness as well. So were, are people more responsive than others? And that's still coming out. So. so that's our human work. We're going to shift a little bit now and focus on the diabetes and start asking a question. Since protein turnover impacts protein function, what happens to mitochondrial proteins with diabetes? That's our main question we're trying to focus on here. So now we're going to shift over to the mouse. And this is work that is ongoing um, right here, just over at LPI. Our first question is, what happens to the mitochondrial proteome with high-fat feeding? This is our model of insulin resistance. Okay? Um, we sent back proteins um, out uh, with collaborators um, back at Mayo Clinic. Uh, an excellent resource of um, proteomics is Srendra Dasari, just a great informatics guru. Uh, we worked with him on a simple question, comparing a low-fat versus a high-fat diet. These are mice that are insulin resistant. What proteins were changed in the mitochondria? And then what metabolic pathways were altered? So when we generate these proteomic data, we identify individual proteins, and that's what's listed out here. I'm not expecting anyone to memorize the, the lists and the names of these gene symbols. The point here is that we can identify individual proteins. And then this is their symbol, and this is a, a p-value just representing the significance of the change. We compare that relative to the between the dietary groups, and in this case, the bars that are extending upwards, those are greater in the high-fat fed mice, the insulin-resistant mice here. I'm going to classify these ge generically and identify all these proteins. There's about 40 of them have been identified as being greater in the obese mice. Okay? And what's interesting here is that a number of them are related to burning off fats, so beta-oxidation, the transport of lipids into the mitochondria. So these are all pathways that seem to be going up, okay? even though these mice are insulin resistant. 
A curious one we're, we're teasing apart right now is there seems to almost be an imbalance between certain pathways are really going up versus other pathways don't seem to be going up as robustly. And what we're questioning now is, is there something maybe within these pathways um, that is different between the two and maybe one's more important than another for contributing to insulin resistance? So we're still teasing that out. Now these are all individual proteins. A problem with identifying individual proteins is you end up sort of with this one hit wonder and saying, well, this one bar is really big, but how much does it actually affect a metabolic pathway? So we took all the proteins, not just these ones that changed at a significant level, we took all the proteins that we identified. There's over 2,000 of them. Some were high, some were low. We put them into a pathway analysis called a gene set enrichment analysis. What this does is it takes into account subtle variations in proteins and then analyzes pathways about it. It asks the question, are there coordinated changes in proteins? So for example, you could imagine that if there were maybe 10 proteins that all had very small changes, perhaps those were coordinated enough to influence a pathway. And maybe one of those proteins is an important gatekeeper on that pathway. And it has a big influence on that pathway, even though it changed very little. So that's what this, this approach takes into account. So it's less, uh, less affected by those one-hit wonders, those really big proteins that change. When we did that analysis, of the top 10 pathways that were identified as being increased with our insulin-resistant mice, Eight of those were specifically involved with burning off fats. One of them was involved with the transport of fats in and out of the mitochondria. So nine out of the 10 of the pathways that changed were at some level involved with lipid metabolism. And specifically when we identify what their names are, these are the top five where we have the metabolism of lipids was increased. This is kind of a generic one. so. We don't really like just calling something metabolism. So I'm going to ignore that and focus more on the fatty acids, the triacylglycerols. These are all related with lipid metabolism here. And then specifically, there is beta oxidation, which is one of the initial steps in lipid oxidation. So overall, we had insulin-resistant mice that had more mitochondrial proteins specifically for burning off fats. This raises the question then of that traffic jam issue saying perhaps we have lots of mitochondria around, they can burn off lots of fats. Okay. So overall we had this remodeling of the mitochondrial proteome towards greater lipid oxidation. Okay. We next asked the question, what if we treat these animals and make them insulin sensitive? Can we alter their mitochondrial function? So this was a project where we did the same low versus high fat feeding, make them insulin resistant, give them diabetes, and then we treated them with pioglitazone, which is an insulin sensitizer. Okay? What that allowed us to have is we had a group of mice that were obese but insulin sensitive. Okay? So they were very sensitive compared to these low fat mice. We put them through a number of metabolic monitoring tests. I'm going to highlight one of the new capabilities that are here at OSU right now. This is an image of a new whole body metabolic monitoring system that is right now at LPI and it's in use right now, right Sarah? Yeah, yeah, we got mice in it right now. Um, so what these are, individual little cages where the mouse can live for however long, usually a period of 24 to 48 hours. They have food, water, and I'm zooming in right here. You can just sort of barely see it, but our mouse is sitting right here. He's got a little habitat that he can live in. The food hoppers are back there. He's got water. He's got his bedding. So it looks like a, a pretty normal little cage for the mouse. But what's also in there are tubing that's sampling the air, and we can measure what's their energy expenditure. Okay? From that, we can also calculate what kind of substrates are these animals using? Are they burning fats? Are they burning carbohydrates? This is all in real time. These little black bars around here are also infrared sensors that measures how active is the mouse. So we can see, are they walking around the chambers? Are they sleeping? Are they running? Things like that. And we can map all these together. Are they running around, burning off energy? And what are they burning? 
So this is a new system. It's available for use. So if anyone is interested in mouse research, this is um, available for anybody. We're looking forward to having more people be involved in these. Here's some example data of, of what we can generate. So the mice go in, they acclimate for a period of time, and then for about 24 hours, they're given free access to food. We do this over 24 hours because mice eat at night and then during the day they sleep. Okay. Then we can also take away their food for 24 hours. This produces a bit of a stress on them and it forces them to see can they shift their fuel use from the food they eat to the food that they stored. It's an ability to see their flexibility and their metabolism here. I'm going to focus in on the, the fed state right now. We're looking at the balance between burning off carbohydrates and lipids. So bars that are lower down here, animals are oxidizing fats more. Bars that are higher, they're burning off carbs. We've got our obese mice compared to our lean and our insulin sensitive group. I'm just going to draw the data straight here. These are our, our high fat mice. They are burning off more fats all the time, whether they're in their feeding state at night or their feeding state in the daytime, regardless of their insulin sensitivity. Okay? They're always able to burn off fats, leading us to believe that it's probably just their dietary availability. They've got more fats around, so they need to oxidize more of it. When we put on that fasting stress, notice that everybody now shifts themselves over to burning off fats regardless of their insulin sensitivity as well. So it seems that all the animals are still metabolically flexible. They're able to shift here. Our take home out of this is that the whole body lipid metabolism was much higher in the obese mice, regardless of their insulin sensitivity. So the insulin resistance was not necessarily a defect in their ability to burn off fats. They could still do it really quite well. We wanted to take it one step further though. Let's see what the mitochondria can do. So we isolated out their mitochondria, and we put in fatty acid-linked respirations. So we gave them fats and said, how well can they oxidize them? Our two groups of lean mice burned them off to a similar extent. But here's what happened with the obese mice. They got really good at burning off fats in both the insulin-sensitive and the insulin-resistant group. So the high-fat fed mice could burn fats off really quite well. In comparison, we gave them non-lipid substrates and did a second test to see, is this just a mitochondrial thing or is this a lipid-specific thing? The take-home off of this, these are non-lipid substrates. We have three different ones that we've analyzed here. And just gen generically, you can see that there's not major differences between any of the treatment groups here. So the main difference is then or in the lipid substrates. Okay? The gains in respiration with obesity were specific to lipids, not generically across the mitochondria. The last question we asked on these mice is perhaps it's that protein synthesis concept. Maybe are they making more mitochondria here? The way we measured this making of more mitochondria is this, this tracer of water. Okay? The tracer I talked about before was one of, for an amino acid. This one, we give labeled water in, to the mice. What happens is they drink this deuterium oxide. Normal water is H2O, this water is D2O. Okay? The deuterium goes into their body water pool, it floods in and it raises up the deuterium content. A number of processes use the deuterium out of that pool to synthesize parts of the mitochondria, parts of DNA, cholesterol, and fat. So now we can have a way to label up new fats, new proteins, new DNA over time. And the rate of synthesis is just calculated from how much deuterium gets put into these. What's neat about this is it's a long-term measure over several weeks. You can do this in mice, you can do this in humans, you can even do this in cells too. What we found is that, very similar to the mitochondrial respiration stories, the synthesis story is that the high-fat-fed mice 
had higher synthesis rates of mitochondrial proteins, regardless of their insulin sensitivity. Okay? So they can oxidize more fats, they seem to have more mitochondria around, and they seem to be making more mitochondria. I'd like to do a quick point out of these, these differences here. Because at, at first glance, you might say, that's not a very large difference. You know, I, I might not buy that effect. I'm going to draw attention to the rates here. We measure these in percentages per day of newly synthesized proteins. Okay? And so these differences of somewhere around half a percent per day means that in somewhere around 1 to 200 days, there's going to be a full renewal of all the proteins. If we could imagine if you had your house and it was being completely renewed every 200 days, you could probably evoke some pretty serious remodeling changes. Okay? Same idea here. It might seem like a small difference, but over time this could accumulate into some pretty major effects. Okay? So that was the synthesis side. Let's talk about the degradation side now. Okay? How does degradation impact, or insulin resistance affect pathways of degradation? This is um, a couple of projects that are headed up um, by Sarah and Harrison, our PhD students. We've got our general model again of the low versus the high fat to induce insulin resistance. And now we're asking the question acutely, how do these pathways respond to insulin? Like in the human, we can do an insulin infusion into the mice. So we have three different conditions where one, we're infusing insulin. The second is we're infusing high insulin with a lot of glucose around. And the third is our saline control. So in a mouse, putting an IV in is a little bit more difficult. So this is a quick video of what this actually looks like here. This is um, from a couple of mice that uh, we recently did over at LPI. And what we see here is this is a mouse who has an indwelling catheter put in right here. And then these lines are going up to control the insulin and the glucose that's going in. The mice tolerate this really quite well. As you can see, it's walking around during the clamp itself. So this is the controlled in infusion of insulin. And we're going to zoom out here a little bit. This first pump is, is controlling the glucose infusion rate right here. This is the one that we adjust on real time. So we check the blood glucose every couple minutes and adjust that pump. The second pump here is adjusting the insulin infusion or the controlled insulin infusion rate. So both of them are going in and the mouse really just lives in his little Tupperware for about two hours here and is really quite content to, to be here. What it looks like here is when we measure the glucose and or we adjust the glucose infusion rate, these are the low, uh, the high fat fed mice. They require much less glucose to maintain their blood sugars here. Classic insulin resistance here. So the model is very effective at making the mice insulin resistant. At the end of that clamp, we can then sacrifice the mice, collect the tissues, and we have their tissues under the insulin stimulated condition. And then we can ask the question, did the obese mice have a different response compared to the saline or the lean mice? Okay. We have our three different conditions. We have our saline condition, that's our control. We have a high insulin condition. And we're looking at the, the degradation markers okay, to see, do they change? And what we found is that between the low and the high fat mice, both low and the high fat mice were able to decrease their markers for this protein degradation pathway. So they seem to be responsive pretty equally. The insulin resistant mice didn't necessarily have an impaired response to them. And that was to the higher insulin. When they had a lot more in insulin around, this is a much higher insulin along with high glucose, that degradation pathway was suppressed even more. Our bottom line is uh, that these degradation pathways seem to be responsive to insulin and glucose. When we run our, our quick statistics on there, um, the, the treatment effects, so the uh, high insulin dosage are really um, consistent across the board here. Okay. This is a paper that we're actively writing up right now, so hopefully we can get this out um, pretty soon. This is spearheaded by Sarah right now. 
So then we're asking a question, what about these beneficial effects of exercise? We said exercise increases protein turnover. It protects against the buildup of damaged proteins in humans. But what about mice? Are these degradation pathways really critical in mice? The final approach that we're working on right now is in a mouse model that cannot activate these degradation pathways. So it has a genetic modification. It does everything else fine. The one thing it can't do very well is when you put them on a treadmill, they don't activate these degradation pathways, which is the normal response. Uh, this is spearheaded by Sarah right now. Um, we have about 60 animals going through per genotype. Um, and we do a lot of metabolic testing on these animals. What I'm going to be focusing on here is um, our preliminary data where we've got the low versus the high fat mice. We make them insulin resistant for four weeks, and then we do a, the treadmill training between the two genotypes here. And yes, we can exercise train a mouse. This is what it looks like here. So the mice get put on at a slight incline, and <laughs> The treadmill starts up, and they do a pretty good job of staying up to the front. At times, they need to be encouraged with a little nudge in the bum or a little puff of air or something like that, but for the most part, they do pretty well. So um, our whole lab has really been involved quite a bit in this. Um, Sarah and Bergen have really been taking on a, a bulk of this treadmill training. This is an hour per day at four groups, so that's about four hours per day of, of running these mice. So we put them into the metabolic system. And these are the preliminary data right now that are, are really kind of fun. So we're asking the question, how does the exercise training and the diet affect their whole body respiration? We're going back to the lipid and the carb burning off concept. We've got our, our fed condition immediately after exercise. Then we allow them to be in there for a little bit longer um, so it gets more of their resting condition. And then with the fast to see if they can switch their substrates. Okay. I've highlighted right here the high-fat fed mice. Again, the high-fat fed mice are burning off lipids, whether they're right after exercise or they've had time to rest for a bit or when they're fasted, even more. They're always burning off fats. The low-fat mice are burning off more of the carbs. Again, that's what their diet is mostly rich in, so that makes sense. And then over time, as they switch over to fasting, they're able to switch their metabolic substrates here pretty efficiently. Now, a quick note would be, wait, there's only six groups in here. There should be eight or some other controls. These are ongoing. We have a couple other mice that are, we're finishing up over the next couple months, and so we'll have a complete data set pretty soon. So that's their whole body. What about their mitochondria? Well, we've got a similar story coming in when we measure their ability to respire lipids. Okay, so we isolate the mitochondria, put their lipids back in again. Both the... Um, the high-fat diet groups have this much higher capacity to oxidize lipids. Again, we're not seeing any impairments to the mitochondria to burn off the fats. Here. So we're looking forward to adding in the additional control groups as well pretty soon here. So um, if you see us walking back and forth between the LPI, we're actively doing this right now. So those are the mouse projects. What about the cells, and what can cells tell us? The final question that I'll be addressing here is a project that's been spearheaded by um, two of our undergrad students, Sarah and, or, uh, Bergen and Emily, who are um, here with us. Thanks for coming, guys. Um, we're asking this question, are there intrinsic differences in mitochondrial function within muscle cells? This allows us to take a cell and independent of any other things in the body, we grow them up and then pretty uh, intricately be able to test very specific pathways of mitochondrial respiration here. These are part of each of their honors thesis projects. So again, we've got a little bit more preliminary data. I wanted to kind of put some teasers out there here. What we're measuring here is the, the cell's ability to burn off fats. And we're testing two different cell types here. One cell type came from a mouse. The other cell type came from a rat. The reason we're doing this these cell types are used extensively in metabolic research, particularly in mitochondria. And we're trying to ask the question, what is their intrinsic capacity to burn off fats? And can that reveal any new um, pathways or regulatory points in lipid respiration? 
right off the bat, we notice well, these cells that came out of this, um, this rat cell line are respiring fats at a lower capacity. It's an interesting observation. We're, we're teasing this off a little bit. But one thing that Bergen and Emily have done is they're also measuring the reactive oxygen species production. These are the products that go on to damage proteins. And a curious thing that we're finding is that the cells that had lower respiration over here have a much higher production of these reactive oxygen species. And we're starting to ask some questions. What is it? Are they just intrinsically dysfunctional? They're shuttling for some reason to generate more reactive oxygen species? We don't know. Perhaps these guys will know in a couple, couple months as you uh, present your honors project. So stay tuned for that. Ultimately, all these projects are centered at some level on investigating, does nutrient overload impact cellular respiration, and how does that impact insulin regulatory pathways? We do that across humans, mice, and cells. Each of them can produce some unique pieces of the puzzle that we then try to integrate and translate to improving human health. So to summarize, or take home goals, one, hope there's appreciation that mitochondrial metabolism can be dynamically regulated during skeletal muscle insulin resistance, that alterations of protein turnover, the renewal of that damaged car is an important consideration, and that overnutrition, and not necessarily an intrinsic pathology, there's not necessarily a defect within the mitochondria that seems to be related to the disease progression of insulin resistance. So thank you all. I'd like to do a quick thanks to, first off, my wife, who's been the amazing support, helped me get basically to where I am. Um, couldn't do it without her. She supported me probably more than any funding agency because she put me through graduate school here. Um, Sean, my collaborator, a longtime friend, has just been outstanding. All of our students, um, so Sarah and Harrison, our PhD students, have been putting in some really long hours on some really interesting projects. Emily and Bergen, you guys have been a huge help over the past couple of years, so thank you very much. We have collaborators at Colorado State University doing the uh, deuterium labeling. Um, and then uh, my old mentor at Mayo Clinic has just been an outstanding friend and guide through all this. The people who actually pay the bills were supported from the, the NIH the, through the NIDDK, the Diabetes Institute in particular. Um, Sean supported through a K award um, through Oregon Health um, uh, University. Um, our Mouse Metabolic Phenotyping Center at Vanderbilt has been outstanding help in guiding us and training on the clamps, being able to do that. It's a very involved process to get it established here. And then all of our students are supported very well. Sarah's been on a, a Provost Distinguished Fellowship. Uh, Harrison has been on a Maxud F Fellowship for Exercise Physiology. And Emily and Bergen, uh, you guys have really uh, just <laughs> taken the cake on a number of the undergraduate research awards there. Um, we're supported by the Collins Medical Foundation and the John Urkeleff Foundation. This is all of our human study as well. So thank you all. I'm happy to talk a little bit more. Thanks.